Um, I would just say, actually, fascinated by the previous discussion, um, I come from the Trade Union Congress. Trade unions in the UK are probably one of the most regulated communities that there is, and our regulations go back, I think the most recent one was 1992, so we've not exactly been recently visited. But I think, actually, one of the reasons for that is that we do have a regulator who you've probably never heard of, um, a man called the Certificate, it is a man, a man called the Certification Officer. Um, and I think the reason that you very rarely hear about him is that we've built up such a I wouldn't say an incestuous relationship, but such a good relationship, a cosy relationship with him, that almost before problems arise, the unions know that he has an office that is always open for conversations without the sword of Damocles being hung over the union to the extent that they think, I can't really tell him what the problem is because he'll just come in and do what regulators do and will be taken to court. Um, and what he's been very good at doing is having those conversations, leading them through the problem and seeing if the matter can be resolved. It's usually between them and their members because um, that's what's regulated, the relationship between the two. Um, so I would recommend where possible, and I realise this is parallel council level rather than parliament but if you know communities can get close to their regulator uh, it actually can be a very productive way of effectively co-regulating an area that with us is quite controversial actually um, it's not particularly on strikes but on you know the powers of unions and their relations with their members the relations with the employers and so on but that was my way of a quick sort of linking point and a preamble what I'm going to do in my now 14 minutes um, is uh, talk to you about three contextual issues that I hope are quite challenging. Um, the first one of which is that I would suggest to you that governments overregulate when they can't understand risk. And I'd also suggest to you that governments increasingly politicise re regulation uh, and elevate it into a political act rather than a means of achieving a policy aim. And I go even further than that, and I would say that regulation now has become the property of political parties to the extent that they go into elections now with a mantra, um, and Eve was talking about this a little bit earlier on the panel, about deregulating, having bonfires of regulation and so on. So it's become a sort of policy in itself, which is really, when you think about it, quite extraordinary, because that's actually, it's a process, isn't it? But there we are. There are also governments are all very susceptible now to pretty ferocious lobbying. Uh, and this government, and indeed the last one actually, were quite highly susceptible, I'd suggest, to lobbying <laughs> by business organizations. Um, and yet, that's a curiosity, isn't it? Because actually, I, I always go and investigate these things, and I'm, I listen a lot to business. We have to, you know, we work with employers all the time. So if they're complaining about regulation, I want to hear about it. But one of the things that puzzled us a lot is that the evidence has always struck us as being a little bit anecdotal. Uh, and one thing that I would recommend, if you've got the interest in this, is to go and have a look at some evidence which is on the business department's website this week, which went out there and actually talked to real small businesses, one-to-one -one out there in the high street, wherever they are and said what are your problems what are your perceptions of regulation and so on and actually uh, they didn't say employment regulation and health and safety regulation uh, were huge issues for them their main concerns were about issues like getting capital from banks in order to be able to invest uh, in growth they weren't actually all that bothered about regulation so I think sometimes there can be a disconnect between the powerful lobbying organizations um, and the views of the consumers or the employees or members of the public who they may represent. And I would turn that accusation in fairness on the TUC, as I'm sure some of you will. I mean, I know we at times will charge off down the field uh, with something that we think is absolutely outrageous and must be stopped, only to discover uh, that it was only one particularly vociferous union that had a problem with it, and the other 99 don't see it as a problem at all. So I would say that everyone has to be a bit wary now of sophisticated lobbying on issues like regulation. But moving on to risk, which I'm supposed to be doing, I think policy making and regulation would benefit enormously from a much fuller and more rounded consideration of risk. And I would suggest that this should happen partly through the training and workplace development uh, given to civil servants who, who do make the regulations to a large extent, but also through a political understanding that really does need to start to emerge in all our main political parties. Any government that has the courage to tackle issues of risk handling and, respon and response opens itself, we think, to an enormous prize, not only a step change in the effectiveness of its regulatory framework, but also the promise of a much more engaged and trusting relationship with the public around issues that have a very significant day-to-day -day impact on people's lives and on their attitudes. <clears throat> 
The problem is that distorted perceptions of risk encourage very poor policy making and sometimes, frankly, unnecessary laws. And I'm not just talking about overreactions to big crises. I think it was actually perfectly understandable, for example, that following the, the horrible Hatfield train crash a few years ago, immediately all train speeds on the entire UK network were slowed down to crawling pace uh, as an instant reaction to the, to the crash. Uh, despite the fact, actually, if you're an expert on risk, you would immediately spot that the impact of that is going to be to drive people onto the roads and proportionately people are much more likely to be killed on the motorways, especially if there's extra traffic because the railways aren't functioning properly, than they would have been, the risk would be much greater than if they travelled on the trains going at the normal speeds. But I do understand that no government I suspect, is ever going to have the courage to say, well, actually, it is a risk. There may be another train crash, but we're going to keep the system going. That's what we're going to do. But it's a tricky one. I, I don't blame politicians, in a sense, uh, for being risk averse, but it is a big, difficult policy issue. I'm I wanted to talk today a bit more about day-to-day -day decisions, though, however, rather than reactions to big crises on how and when to regulate things like maternity legislation which is highly topical at the moment very politicized uh, sale of tobacco another politicized one planning regulations another politicized one all day-to-day -day stuff but very important to different communities at different times and all involving risk in one measure or another and risk is actually everywhere in policy making every policy seeks to increase the chance of one outcome relative to another outcome and of course, people's perceptions of risk differ very much from the actual levels of risk, something Eve was talking about just now. And I think these differences are often what push governments towards making unnecessary policies and laws. Policies and laws which then lead people to think that government is interfering too much in their lives. And you get that syndrome where the Daily Mail on one page will say something must be done, uh, and on the other page will be saying the nanny state has to stop interfering. So there's a terrific um, contradiction within media perceptions, but they lead politicians. Politicians will often do what the Daily Mail is suggesting that they should do because they're sensitive and they're always looking uh, to the next election. Now, the former Risk and Regulation Advisory Council, uh, the RRAC, uh, which Philip down there and I were both on, um, investigated the reasons why inappropriate policies and law continue to be promoted, despite the good intentions of ministers, very careful attention from civil servants, and numerous initiatives within Whitehall to improve policy making. Now, the RRAC uh, sought to understand what could be done to prevent and limit the factors which encourage inappropriate responses to risk and developed a number of recommendations which were set out a couple of years ago in a report to government. And we suggested that by looking at regulation through the lens of risk, new insights can be gathered to tell us why disproportionate responses, unwelcome curtailment of civil liberties or simply overmanaged lives have accumulated over time and from that how they might most effectively be corrected. And we developed various approaches and tools to help government to foster a more thoughtful and preemptive policy making culture with a real focus on outcomes even at times of crisis challenging concepts like zero risk tolerance, should we have a zero risk tolerance, encouraging a much better understanding amongst the public of risk and how to handle it, and a much more considered balancing of risk, costs and benefits. The other thing we did, and those tools were all around, and again, I would wish the government would take more notice of them. It's a terrible waste of public resource to have all that done and not have it being used more intelligently out there. You can see it all still under the, on the BIS website if you're interested, uh, or contact me and I can send you packages of things that were very useful in this regard. But we also identified uh, creatures that we called risk actors or risk mongers, uh, and those were people who interpret and mitigate risk on behalf of others, or in some cases actually make a profit out of talking risk up. Um, risk actors would include regulators uh, and also standard setters, people like that. Risk mongers who make a profit out of talking risk up, um, and I'm not pulling my punches here, include insurance companies. I mean, that's their main business, isn't it? Uh, lawyers, they've already been castigated earlier on, but I'm afraid they do it as well. Uh, and also, as I've said, the media. Moving on to something that may really wind some people up, but I'm going to say it anyway because I'm the TUC and they pay me so I can get away with it. But my second point is that business claims about overregulation, I have already suggested, are largely based on a pretty fraudulent premise. Now, the reason I say that is that the premise is that there's too much regulation and that it's impeding their growth somehow. I really would challenge business to demonstrate citing evidence rather than anecdotes and hearsay uh, to you know, to actually produce evidence to persuade me and everyone else and, you know, 
th right thinking people, economists and all the rest, what is sufficient and how deregulation, in fact, would actually encourage growth. I don't think, I think it's absolute rubbish, that argument, frankly. Uh, and if you don't believe me, I'll come on in a minute to somebody who talks a lot more sense about that, uh, the, one of the big economic institutions. Business may be badly regulated in some areas, I accept that, and of course that should be addressed. It's not in anyone's interest, not least the employee's interest. Um, but I don't think they are over-regulated by and large. In fact, the UK is one of the least regulated of the OECD nations, that's the Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development, on most measures of labour market flexibility. We're far less tightly regulated than Germany, for example, which has weathered the economic storms much better than we have. Now, some may suggest that's due to all sorts of extraneous factors and nothing to do with regulation. Well, in that case, I'd make exactly the same arguments about the UK. The problems that we're having at the moment relate to other factors, such as the failure to promote and support innovation, for example, lack of financial credit for small and medium enterprises, which I referred to earlier, and a decision, and this is very political, but it is a political decision that's been made to make savage public sector cuts rather than doing other economic measures, uh, for example, like stimulating growth through infrastructure projects, and some right-wing economic think tanks are now arguing, actually, that you should be investing money in building toll roads and so on, simply to give work to people, to get them spending, to stimulate the economy. And there are good, sound economic arguments as well, actually, for paying off the national debt at a much slower rate. So I would even argue with the premise, I accept, and Susie said this earlier, we have got big economic problems and there are needs to make savings. And in any case, that's not a bad thing always for a government to do, but I don't think the scale of it is appropriate to the problem. And I think it's actually now in danger of making things much worse. So in other words, I'd say it's the economy stupid, not the red tape or the regulation. I won't bore you with... Um, huge amounts of detail of what academics have said about, uh, you know, uh, various economic models, because I think that's outside my competence, really, and it would simply be reading other people's speeches out. But what I will say um, is that there are plenty of examples in the UK where regulation of the employment market has actually stimulated growth. One of the classic ones was the national minimum wage, which, when it came in um, at the end of the 1990s with the new Labour government, there were cries of woe from the CBI and others. You know, unemployment would rocket. Companies would be falling by the wayside. The whole thing was a pernicious intervention completely unnecessary, even though there were some people being paid a pound an hour to do the most appalling jobs you can imagine. Uh, but actually, once the national minimum wage came in, as it happened, employment went whooshing up, businesses thrived, and you would be very hard put to it now to find a serious business spokesperson who would argue against having a national minimum wage, because it's had a huge impact on uh, all sorts of issues, not least of which uh, is improving standards across the piece amongst employers and bringing them all generally up, which actually in the long run saves a lot of money through waste, through litigation and through all sorts of other consequences um, of not having that kind of basic regulation. My last point, which I'm just coming to, because I don't want to go on too long, um, is probably, again, slightly controversial here, and I certainly wouldn't. The last thing I'd mean, mean to do is offend you, Cass, so don't take this in any way personally. But I do think, uh, thirdly and finally, that there are some alternatives to regulation uh, that are really regulation in disguise. So I think you have to be a bit careful if you're stripping regulation away about what you substitute in its place, if you accept that there's a need for some sort of control of a process, a procedure to protect employees, or the public. What I've got in mind is anything that becomes, as they say, admissible in legal proceedings. So, for example, if a court is looking at an alleged breach of regulation and finds against an employer, I'm using employers because that's my comfort zone, uh, or indeed it could be a public body because they failed to acquire a standard of some sort, that standard then in practice has become a regulation. Uh, and it does happen in health and safety and elsewhere. The courts have said, well, never mind the statute, but let's have a look at the standards, and that's what we'll judge whether or not you comply with the regulation on the basis of. So a standard, which isn't a regulation, in effect has become a regulation because it's having exactly the same impact. Now, that's not the fault of the standard setters. Um, they're often trying to fill gaps in regulation. They're not actually particularly trying to substitute for regulation or you know, embellish it. Um, but what I'm suggesting that is that in many cases, if you're at the receiving end, a standard can sometimes be indistinguishable from a regulation. And you, we do have to look at things uh, from the perspective of those who are being regulated. But on the other hand, we like standards, actually, where I come from. Uh, and they can be very, very helpful in developing good practice, which is over and above compliance with regulation. And I think generally, therefore, to be welcomed. And I'd apply exactly the same 
uh, comment actually to guidance and non-statutory codes and one of the frustrations that we're having on the regulatory policy committee is that our remit is relatively narrow and although we can look at regulation literally we've got absolutely no uh, power or remit to look um, at guidance and non-statutory codes which actually play a very large part effectively in regulating things um, and also while I'm on it we're also not allowed to look at financial regulation so there's some gaps in what we're actually able to do but nonetheless I think we're doing a, a pretty good job Job. I would suggest that the problem lies with attempts to replace regulation by something else that will achieve the same effect. I think there's a lot of this talk going on in the government about we'll strip the regulation away uh, and put something else in there. If it's not going to achieve the same effect, then it is regulation. Um, if, sorry, if it really is going to achieve the same effect, then it is regulation, I would suggest, in some shape or form. If it's not regulation by another name, then it's not by itself going to achieve the same aim. It may achieve our aim, but it won't be the same aim, I don't suppose. But it may achieve a good and productive end of a different order. So I'm not saying you chuck babies out with bathwaters, but there needs to be a lot of intelligent thinking done about all this, I'd suggest. Now, just for the record, before I finish, because I'm always sort of wary of, I get defensive on these occasions, because that's how we get trained at the TUC. Uh, but for the record, we've never in the TUC argued that collective bargaining, the process through which unions <laughs> and employers regulate employment relations and other things is anything other than a system of regulating the workplace. Um, regulation indeed can come from all sorts of quarters and one of the reasons for the increase in employment protection regulation, uh, frankly, is the diminishing presence of trade unions in the UK. But unless you, you know, you want to go back to the Victorian approach and have no regulation at all of work, there's going to have to be some form of regulation. And I think, in a way, former governments, for particular political reasons, traded trade union recognition in the workplace and a role for trade unions 95% of the time not on strike, doing hard work on safety issues and so on, and regulating pay and all those sort of issues. That was swept away in the private sector. We don't have, we're about 14% membership in the private sector now. Uh, but what you've got instead now is a panoply of individual rights. And I wouldn't argue against those. You've got to have some basic rights. But again, a question for you is, is there, are there areas uh, where you can have what the government, I think, calls earned autonomy, where you can have a light, literally have a light touch on the regulation, if there are trusted alternatives that are effectively a form of, of regulation? So I'm trying not to speak entirely against alternatives, but I'm saying you have to look at what they are, who buys into them, uh, and how they're controlled. And I'm just going to finish with a word about nudge, because I've been fascinated by all this nudge. I read the book. Um, I haven't got the badge. Uh, but I think... I'll suggest another thing to you. You probably all know what it is. It's an American idea where you don't have regulation, but you try and prompt uh, appropriate or good behaviour. Now, the first thing I thought about this was it's nothing new. You know, there's been health education around for a long time, which tries to persuade people through example and good sense to look after themselves and avoid ending up in acute services costing everyone a fortune and for their own uh, better health and all the rest of it. I, I worry that the government is thinking that this nudge stuff can become something that you use instead of regulation. I just don't think that's possible. I think it's an important tool that you can use with regulation. And if it really starts to work, then you could perhaps start to look at pulling back on the regulation. But I just don't believe it, frankly. Not as an alternative to some of the basic regulation you need to protect people's health. You wouldn't have got a smoking ban in this country without the regulation, I don't think. Um, and I don't think you're going to get much traction on persuading people not to abuse alcohol uh, without doing something a bit more regulatory about it quite honestly otherwise you just leave it and just say well if people want to drink themselves into a stupor well let it be but I certainly don't think getting large distilleries to sponsor uh, nudge uh, efforts are really doing the nudge product very much good um, so that's another slightly stimulating point for you I'm going to stop there because I'm suspect Michael I've gone well over my time haven't I but um, anyway I hope that's prompted some thoughts and some debates and I'll crawl down to the bottom end of the table and be part of the panel now so thank you very much <laughs>